Greetings, Old Schmidt attendees for the Science and Policy Conference. I'm going to talk about the sixth mass extinction, which is underway. These are extinctions in the vertebrate classes due to climate warming. I'm going to frame the sixth here against the first through five. This will be far faster compared to these others. And then near the end of the talk, I'll even talk about one of these and how it relates to the present. That is the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. So, a brief outline. I want to talk about ectotherm extinctions, reptiles and amphibians, and endotherm extinctions, mammals and birds. And then I'll talk about solutions, reforestation, and in part four, we have all seen all of this before. I'll talk about the Triassic Jurassic climate event. Conformers in ectotherms live in tropical forests. Heliotherms live at higher latitudes. And we figure out their interaction with climate from thermal performance curves, which are a proxy for Darwinian fitness. This is from one of my advisor's papers in science. Now, heliotherms use the sun to get hot. Right now, it's not nearly hot enough for them. That's the temperature in the present day. The future temperature is in red, and the thermal performance curve says it's going to get better. Ray Huey looked at tropical species, and they have a narrower thermal performance curve. And right now, in the present day, they're at the optimum. And as it warms, it's going to get worse for them. So I tested that idea by surveying extinctions around the world of lizard diversity in all of the lizard families of the world. This is, again, from Ray Huey's and Joel King Solver's early 1992 paper. We have thermal habitats, operative environmental temperatures, basically in the environment, how hot is it? That is filtered through things like the body temperature or thermal performance or short-term performance growth, survivorship, and reproduction. Climate change is going to affect the t t through Tmax, the organism will filter and operative environmental temperatures, and it'll effectuate evolutionary change, which is range extinctions, range expansions, or adaptation. Now let's think about operative temperatures. This shows you how hot it can be for, say, a lizard. They can be in hot sites or in relatively cool, shady sites. And this is their how much time they can be active. But there are periods of the day when it's too hot in the coolest sites, and so they are going into retreat under the surface. These are hours of restriction during the day. Under climate change, what you're going to see is that operative environmental temperatures go up as maximum daily temperatures go up, and hours of restriction greatly expand. Now, the probability of local extinction, you can imagine a species' current distribution of hours of restriction looks like this normal distribution. There are some cool sites, but the critical range limit is here. The hottest temperatures observed. As climate warms, the whole range of the population gets hotter, and every population over the critical limit goes extinct. 
Let's look at an example with Chinosaurus in the family Chinosauridae, found in China and down in Thailand. This is all the locations known for this family. In 2050, these show you all of the extinctions that we expect, and they're already starting to suffer down here in Thailand. They are in trouble. By 2080, the whole population is going to be extinct. So how about all of the lizards of the world? Here in 2009, we are already seeing a 4% local extinction, and we have good ability to protect the observed extinctions in eight of the lizard families of the world with our model. By 2050, you are seeing 6% of the lizards of the world extinct, 100% in some areas, all these red areas. To, by 2080, we're going to see many species extinctions, 20%, 100%, and the Amazon here, you can see, is going to suffer. This is Ray Huey's prediction. Here you see latitude and a huge extinction going on in the Amazon and other tropical regions, which greatly expands. And on these curves, you can see the lines for all the families listed here on the right. The tropics may be an extinction hellhole. We may lose 24% of all lizard families. Most are thermal conformers that have that very narrow thermal performance curves. Here is an analysis of all the lizards in the West in North America and in Mexico. By 2070, we're going to see four families of 15 that we analyzed from all the known occurrence records and for 142 museum um, species listings. Based on the biophysics, the phenology, the ecophysiology, and the demography. In RAN, you see all of these extinctions. How about an amphibian example? These are all of the salamander families in the world. This spring, with my herpetology students, we did extinction models across all of the families, and we will likely lose six of the ten families of the world. We will lose the Amphiumidae, the Rhyacotritoninae, the Tychiaptodoninae, the Proteinae, the Cryptobranchinae, and the Cyrenidae. We surveyed the extinctions in the Plethanodinae, the Abistomatinae, the Salamandrinae, and the High Novianae, and they are going to hold on, but we'll lose many of the species. Let me focus on the Cryptobranchinae, so you can see one family. Here we have their metabolic rate, thermal performance curve, that a student in my class, Barrett, obtained from the literature, and we modeled the current distribution in blue in the Appalachians, and over here in the Ozarks, and you can see the current points, they are now beginning to suffer at low elevations in green, and they're starting to go extinct. By 2070, the salamanders might as well move to Canada, up here where I grew up, near the Great Lakes. They will be okay. Maybe we can move them there. Their current occupancy is good, but in the present, in the future, they're going to be gone. Here we have the present in 2070. An extinction is here at Ran Zero. How about a model for mammals and birds? Let me do the sloths, because they're just like 
ectotherms. Here is their metabolic rate curve. And when they're really cold here at low temperature, they curl up in a ball and their metabolic rate goes down. And then at hot temperature, they try to bleed their heat and spread out like a little um, sloth soldier. In the middle, the temperature is just right. These are the Goldilocks zones for all species, and we are exceeding them. Here is a model that Laura Torino at Rio de Janeiro in, um, uh, did with me. And you can see in blue and green in the Amazon, they're doing well. The occupancy probability is really great. But by 2070 in the Amazon, they are largely extinct. They can be moved, but here we have Sahano forest, and we have to reforest the Amazon to save them, as well as the entire Sahano. We have done models of this. If it were wet enough, the Sahano could be reforested like the Amazon. We would lose all the Sahano species, so this would be likely impossible to save the sloth. Okay, occupancy probability. The metabolism of most mammals is not like the lizard or amphibian-like sloth. Most mammals, when they get cool, their metabolism goes up. Or like the armadillo here, their metabolism goes up when they get too hot to cool off. This is another model that Laura Torino is working on. Here is a model of birds that Eric Riddell and my colleagues and I worked on in the deserts. We know that the red is the cooling cost of the metabolic rate curve for these species. This bird is not doing too bad. This one is doing medium okay, but morning doves are really doing worse now in 2009 than they did in 1975, that dash line. They are now going extinct. And birds in the Mojave Desert are going extinct now, right now, due to both temperature and precipitation. The metabolic rate cost, it's not raining enough, and the cost of cooling themselves off is too much. How do we save ourselves? Here we have reforest as a solution. There is a well-known relationship between forest cover, albino, and evapotranspiration, and local land surface temperatures. Prevello, Prevendello and my colleagues and I published a model on this. If you deforest the Amazon or any forest, tropical Rates go up, not just in the deforested area, but five kilometers away in adjacent forest. So even if we had the Amazon as a patchwork of forest and deforested areas, that sloth would be hotter in the forest because of this effect. If we reforest in the whole Amazon, it would be a huge savings. The sum difference is 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperate forests show a similar effect, and then the boreal forests show a reversal, but tiny effect. This is from snow cover. Snow melts on forests, so you get it a little warmer. Here, as if you knew the business as usual in 2050. And it is hot. It is 1.8 degrees hotter. 
But if we reforest the Amazon and the Sahara, we save them, not the Katinga, which stays hot. So, we have a solution, reforest. We have seen this all before. In the Triassic extinction event, this is a paleo model for what we're seeing in the present day. What we saw were CO2 levels rose and forests went and winked out. They got too hot. And that was three to four degrees Celsius of natural greenhouse gassing. In the present day, we expect six to eight. We are screwed. Here is that event right here at the Jurassic boundary. We saw many extinctions. Some made it through. Whole lineages were speciating and made it through. Others went extinct. If you look at the correlation between a phylogeny for thermoregulatory mode, heliotherms or endotherms versus conformers, and who winks out in white, you'll see that many species that were conformers went extinct in the Jurassic Triassic boundary. This is happening now with real species we see. This is a paper I'm working on right now. So we have species of vertebrates have begun going extinct from climate change. We can avert the catastrophe of this sixth mass extinction. We can lower atmospheric CO2. Reforestation is a very cheap solution with the added benefits of resilience from drought. This can sequester large quantities of CO2 and at the same time, low, low local temperatures in forests and we can save these species from becoming toast. Thank you.